Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to bring to you today Ron Camps. Ron is the business resilience manager for Mutual of Enumclaw. Ron started his career in 1997, so he has 25 years of experience. Ron's business continuity experience goes back to 1997. Over the years, he's picked up lots of learnings, smart things to do, tricks of the trade, and I'm particularly delighted about one point he makes in this interview about how he gets the best out of his ITDR colleagues. And that's what this podcast is all about, for people to get a fast forward, learn without making mistakes, learn from others, and be able to just do a much better job as BCM professionals. Ron comes from the insurance industry, but it's my view that you can learn a lot from your industry and you can learn a lot from an industry that's very different. So without further ado, let me give you Ron Kemp's. Well, well, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to speak today. The, so I've been um, had the privilege to work in various industries over my 20-year uh, career. And insurance is, is one of the industries that's unique because if, if we have a, we, in the insurance industry, we protect people and their property. That's our job. You as a, what we call a policy holder, um, purchases a policy with us for your home, your car, your you know, automobile, different things like that. And so during a time of your crisis, it becomes our crisis. And so we have a double crisis in the business, from a business continuity lens, we have a double crisis potential. And a, an example of that is if you, if there is a significant, in the United States, uh, probably our largest um, natural disasters are hurricanes. And so if there's a hurricane, we would have multiple policyholders uh, potentially impacted from their home and vehicle and, and disruption. And we also have to be supporting that. And so then if we have offices or facilities in that same vicinity, that geographic vicinity that the hurricane impacts, then we almost have a triple um, disaster scenario. So it's interesting from that standpoint, when you have a large geographical um, incident, it impacts members, uh, people like yourself, as well as um, our ability potentially to support those members. And it's risky because that's the reason why people have insurance. So we have to be very aware and put in, hopefully put in policies, procedures, um, continuity, et cetera, to be able to support people where we are not, if they're impacted, we are not impacted. That puts a lot of pressure on you. And to be honest, I never thought of it from that point of view that when everyone else is down, you have to be up. Correct. <clears throat> and that's, that's tough. Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, at times like this, uh, I guess in a very uh, indirect sense, this starts to also flow into the expected resumption timelines and RTO and, and, and MTP, M MAO, et cetera. So on a very gut feel basis, uh, if you're able to share numbers, great. If you aren't, no problem at all. But what therefore tend to be the priority uh, activities or processes that an insurance uh, entity would need to restore in preference to the others? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, our people come to insurance to protect themselves. And so uh, if you think about you go to a uh, Starbucks to get coffee or tea, you, you expect that service when you go there. And so in the insurance industry, it's not a daily interaction. It can be a you know, an annual interaction or a once a decade interaction or once a lifetime interaction or never an interaction. And yet you have this service there that, and you, so, um, so we, we think of that initial interaction as the most, one of the most important processes. So if you have an event where you require to call us, you're, you're in an automobile accident, your house had a fire or damage to it. Those are, that's that 
interaction, like you go to Starbucks and, and say, I want my, my chai tea, that's the time where you're coming to us. And so we call that first notice of loss when, when a member or policyholder reaches out to us. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, because we, we, you know, we provide automobile insurance, automobiles are uh, often they, uh, a key livelihood of, of our policyholders. And so we prioritize automobiles in the sense that um, if there is a breakdown or your windshield uh, gets cracked or broken, uh, we prioritize that because we know if you, if you don't have your automobile, access to your automobile, you're unable to potentially go to work or support your children, your family, et cetera, do your business. And so, we, in a, so we look at claims, we have different categories of claims. And so for automobiles, we have those that are, I would call more simpler incidents, fixing a windshield or getting a tow, tow truck to, to, to take you off the road and get right. you to safety. Those are examples of things that we want to do as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, compared to if you have your primary home burns down, that is a longer process where we you know, physically have to have somebody go out, inspect the home, investigate, ask you know, questions, et cetera. So, so there's processes that we can do quickly and other processes that take a little bit longer uh, time. So it, it's almost as if the business country thought process has also had to be customer friendly. Um, what does the customer really need on a priority basis? Let's give them that. And what takes more time, we'll figure it out later. It, yes, it's, and again, going back to the, um, you know, you, uh, many of our listeners might go to their favorite coffee shop every day and they interact every day. Where in an insurance, uh, per, where an insurance carrier, you might never call us um, in a year or five years or 10 years. And so, when you do, it's a new and unknown experience. Be, I mean, when was the last time you called your insurance provider, Diraj? Exactly, exactly. Um, as they say, insurance is the is the uh, the product you don't really want to use. <laughs> so. Correct, correct. So we we definitely recognize that, and we we emphasize customer service um, very much at Mutual of Enum Claw when we have the chance and the opportunity to interact with what we call our members. So when I say policyholder, that's synonymous with members. Right, exactly. And therefore, other than uh, the products that you offer or the responsiveness to those products, probably even the customer touch points become pretty critical in terms of RTO timelines, et cetera. Ab absolutely, so again, our timelines, um, through our BIA process, we identified certain processes that we prioritize. I gave the example of um, a new claims for like a, um, you know, first notice of loss. Um, other, other things that are timely that also have um, would be um, writing, writing new policies. And so if, a, if somebody wants to have a new policy, we try to write that as quickly as possible because that's how we generate our revenue. Right. And as you know, in the insurance industry, we, we collect uh, annual or semi-annual premiums from members. And so uh, we need to collect those to reinvest those in a safe manner. So if somebody does have a, um, a, a file a claim on their home or auto, for example, then we have the ability to pay that out in a timely manner. So paying claims, not just uh, recording a claim, but also the payment of a claim is important because um, uh, the, the, the business resilience industry and the governments recognize that after a large catastrophe like a, a hurricane or a wildfire or flooding in a specific geographic area, it's very important to get the economy up and running. And the economy is, is comprised of people and right. people need their homes and their vehicles to be safe and secure and established. And then they can you know, work on their business and their community and things like that. So we play a critical role 
in uh, reestablishing, you know, economic vitality after uh, a natural or significant disasters. Right. And, and therefore, your obligation is much, much beyond your direct customers. Your obligation is practically to, to the community. Exactly. And we're very, you know, um, you know, speaking for Mutual of Enum Cloud, we're very community based. We, 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 you know, we've been around for over 120 years. And so our goal is to have a 500 year old company where we continue to serve our members in a, in a way that they can trust us and provide valuable service. Well, that's, that, that's a noble goal. Uh, what about regulations, uh, Ron? Uh, I guess a lot of it is driven uh, from your pure corporate governance point of view in terms of being a good citizen and a good insurance entity that people can trust. Um, what are the kind of insurance regulations in the US? And the reason I ask is because many people who's this session, who's, uh, who kind of come and attend and see this talk uh, may not be from geographies which have huge regulation. Um, so it's worth really knowing what's out there in terms of what is typically mandated. And of course, I think you'd be probably even going beyond that in terms of your own um, internal delivery and, and expectation. Insurance is very regulated. Um, I've, I've been in other industries, uh, the airlines, for example, that also has very strict safety regulations. Um, the insurance has a much different set of regulations. And I am, um, I am not a, uh, we have it specifically a compliance manager just to and, manage. And my apologies. And I, yeah. I'll interrupt you here because we can always edit it. I'll repeat it. I actually meant BCM regulations for insurance. Ah. Specifically, so maybe let me just rephrase that and kind of you can start again. Actually, um, actually, before you restart, I don't, I don't believe there are um, uh, BCM regulations for insurance, mm -hmm. but the regu the non BCM regulations do impact business right. continuity. So right. I can speak to that aspect sure. of great, it. Great. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so what about regulations, Ron? Uh, there could be either regulations uh, specifically for business continuity and IT disaster recovery and insurance, or they could be very generic across geographies uh, as a matter of uh, just normal expectation that anyone and everyone needs to do. And so it would be worth uh, just getting a sense of anything uh, from, I would say, a US perspective, uh, which is where you're based and headquartered, uh, the kind of uh, general regulations or specific regulations that also uh, probably encourage the organization to ensure that it has good continuity uh, abilities and uh, perhaps anything else that uh, drives uh, just the overall focus on business continuity uh, in the insurance industry in general and perhaps also in your uh, particular company. Sure. So the insurance industry in the United States uh, falls under one of the critical infrastructures that the U.S. government's identified, and that's the financial. So we're, we fall under the financial uh, critical infrastructure as an insurance carrier. Um, having said that, um, I, because I've worked for um, uh, federal banks uh, before, they had much more strict business continuity related uh, requirements around uh, for business continuity. The insurance industry does not um, have those types of requirements. However, we know um, it's the right thing to do. We, we have an obligation to our members, our policyholders, to be able to uh, provide uh, critical services anytime when they need them. So therefore, even though the government um, doesn't have specific uh, business continuity uh, regulations, we, we still do it. Now, having said that, there, the interesting thing about the United States and the challenge is every state has potentially different mm -hmm. governance requirements. Um, and, and so um, what I didn't share is um, we, we are, as you mentioned, we're uh, headquartered in Washington State in the Pacific Northwest, the very northwest corner of the United States. And we provide service in seven uh, states, generally in the western Western United States. Now, each one of those states uh, can have a different set of regulations in terms of um, filing for uh, claim, uh, I mean, filing for uh, new services, uh, for um, increases in premium. And, you know, as we all 
are, well, I'm not sure. In the United States, we're experiencing a higher rate of inflation right now. And, and, and the, that causes us as carriers to pay more for, for example, car repairs, house repairs. So if a customer has a claim, we, we, we are now all of a sudden having to pay much more money than we were last year. And, and so we, we, you know, also have to be responsible. And so that requires us to raise our premiums as well. Um, and so, but we just can't do that um, automatically. We have to file with the different states to basically ask their permission. Or sometimes they tell us that you cannot raise premiums for certain reasons, or you cannot use people's, um, um, what we call a credit score or things to raise premiums. So there's a lot of different state regulations when we want to go to other states to do business or we need to do current business in states. Let me give you one, one example that's a little bit more relevant to business continuity. So um, we were, as a business, we we're always looking to expand and serve our customers and grow. And so um, we've recently, over the last you know three, four years, we've expanded into some new states. And so we were, um, we were planning to expand into another state. And what this state required us to do was to have a, um, a security assessment done on our things like around business continuity, emergency response, disaster recovery, crisis management, and especially cyber, cyber response, because cyber and data breaches are becoming, unfortunately becoming a more common instance. And so this particular state required us to do an assessment on how we approach um, these things. And that I was, um, I and many other people at our company were very involved in doing interviews with the vendor, doing these assessments, providing documentation around business continuity plans, crisis management plans, disaster recovery plans, response plans, to, and, and they were now, this was a requirement that we had to go through in order to be approved to even start to be able to do business in another state. So that's, that's been an impact. Now, the good news is be, if you're a, you know, if you're a company that's got a good program, it's, it's not that much of a issue because you're already doing these things. But from a procedural standpoint, it's new. So I, I guess what, what I hear you saying is that actually having a good BCM in place helps even ensure that you have good BAU. Um, and it just provides a solid foundation to do new things as you go along. Uh, so that, that is that's correct. Added value. That is correct. Yes. Super. Uh, from your point of view, Ron, uh, if, if you look at uh, um, just the profession as such, um, A, uh, what do you enjoy about the BCM profession, be it in insurance or uh, in, in any industry in general? You've been in this a pretty long time. So if you had to give a sense to new people as to what to expect, uh, what you like about it, uh, why should they go in for something like this? Uh, why should they maybe consciously seek out a career in business continuity amongst many other choices? What would be some good reasons that you would say, this is a good thing to do because? That's a, that's a great question. And, and let me just start by saying, I've been very privileged um, to be able to be a full-time uh, business well, I'll start out full-time disaster recovery and then business continuity. And now we've got business resilience and I'm just waiting for the next term. That's kind of like the next term coming. So over the 20 years that, uh, that I've been doing it, it, the industry has, has changed and morphed and developed. But what I've always liked about it, and again, this is also, um, in my opinion, specific to your organization. So, so I think of it business continuity as a, as a triangle. So if you think of your organization and, and the different people fitting into a triangle, at the bottom layer, you would have all your general employees. 
and and then the next layer up you might have your supervisors and then the next layer up you've got your managers and directors and you go all the way up to the executive and the ceo the thing about business continuity is as a practitioner if you have a program that does crisis management disaster recovery business continuity emergency management you touch every single one of those layers somehow. So I've had the privilege to talk to anybody on the floor that I happen to meet at the water cooler, the, you know, around emergency management, evacuation, because everybody has to evacuate, understand, you know, their mask, our mass communication tools, our safety procedures. You, you get up to the next layer where you're talking to managers and supervisors about business continuity plans that they own from a process level. You get up to the executive level and you talk about cybersecurity at a you know, higher level. You get up to the CEO and you're talking about crisis management. And so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to engage um, everybody in the organization and provide a service to them to help them feel more confident if something bad or unexpected were to happen. And sounds like that's something which actually makes you very unique and gives you a special insight that no one else gets. And to that extent, uh, you're then really a long-term asset and resource for the organization. So it's kind of a win-win. Uh, you have been privileged to be, and, and I mean, you or any BCM professional who gets into this um, have been privileged to have that overall understanding. And that overall understanding then actually makes you a much, much more valuable long-term resource to the organization. So uh, kind of, uh, it, it's a good win-win situation to be in. Well, I'd like to think I'm valuable, and uh, <clears throat> but it's uh, it's it's going back to your original question. That's the reason I like it because I can engage um, in in multiple layers. And again, when I say that, because the organizations that I've chosen to work for are not large multi. I used to work in a Fortune 100. I've worked in Fortune 500, as, in, as, as we refer to in the United States, the size. Um, for me, I like to work in mid-sized companies mm -hmm. because, because that way I have insight into all those various layers where I've worked in organizations where you are, you are, you are pigeoned into only doing disaster recovery or you're pigeoned into doing emergency response safety or you're pigeoned into just the crisis management aspect. Right. And, and those are fine and those are great, but I like, for me, as a business continuity professional, I believe those are all very important, but the most powerful organizations are those that can integrate all of those things into a common program right. where they are connected and they can talk to each other. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, since you happened to mention disaster recovery, and I'd say you walked into the trap, <laughs> uh, and I'd say you probably sounds as if you're in a different role, so you're now interacting with those folks, maybe not running DR, but interacting with the DO folks. So since uh, there'll be many BCM professionals watching this, how do you get the best out of your IT disaster recovery team? So um, that is, if you're not part of the team, how exactly. do you get the best out of the team? Exactly. Yeah, and again, that, that's a great question. And I've had um, uh, uh, success and I've had failures <laughs> <laughs> in that. The, <clears throat> in general, and this is not just for IT, but in general, one of the things that I've spoken to in other places before is as a practitioner, we, we have the ability to do things that sometimes those teams do not, or they might not prioritize. And so what I mean by that is when I do, for example, a BIA, and I've got my list of, you know, my questions around business processes and systems and stuff, before I start the BIA, I would go to IT and I would say, hey, IT, I'm getting ready to interview the entire organization or whatever aspect of the organization I'm scoped to, I would say, I want to ask the right type of IT questions. Here's what I have. 
what would you also like to see? And so I've been able to do that and get, help them get information. <coughs> Take your time, no worries. <laughs> you, you've been great so far, so. So let me give you let me give you an example of of a successful partnership. Prior organization, I was doing a BIA and I went to IT and I said, I asked them, I said, here's my questions around data systems, et cetera. What is there anything else that you would like to know? And they said, yes. They said, we keep finding rogue systems that departments had developed or created themselves over the years. And they are not part of the, the, the IT supported infrastructure. And could you ask that question? And so I did, and I found, I, I can't remember the exact number. I think there was three, maybe four servers that certain departments had hidden under their desks mm -hmm. that they didn't want IT to know because they <laughs> wanted to control it and yet it posed a risk. And so that's just a simple example of whenever I do an activity, I just don't think about what I need. I think about what, what else does the company need? Another, probably the better, even a better example is around HR. So when I interview people or um, teams, you know, contact information is very important and you know, we, like most organizations, have a mass communication system. So in the event something unexpected happens, we have the ability to send out a mass communication to people's cellular phones, their text messaging, their company email, personal email, et cetera. But a lot of times that information isn't uh, confirmed or validated or tested. And so I, I went to our HR department and I said, let's do a quarterly, let's do test because we have all this information. We don't know if it's valid. And so I, I just took that over and, and now we've got, you know, we, we've tested it and we, every time we get new people, we test, we test with them as well, our new, new, new uh, employees. So now we can say with confidence, if we send out a message, everybody's going to get it because we validated it. And if somebody didn't get it, we found out why, you know, and you know, why did, why was the issue? Did they have changed their phone number? Did, does their cellular carrier not support um, mm -hmm. this type of service, which some of them don't. Um, but anyway, that's another example of what can I do to help the company or the other department get information and that builds trust and it builds good partnerships. I think that's brilliant, Ron. Uh, and, and, uh, Anyone who sees this, I think that's gold because there's this perpetual mistrust probably between ITDR and BCM. Um, and I think that's a fabulous way to just cut through it and make sure that we are all in the same team and uh, we are both in it together. So let me, can I give you another example? Please. I, I've, I've been working so long. I have a lot of examples. <laughs> so we, we do um, uh, as every, uh, practitioner knows cyber is one of the number one risks these days, data breaches, ransomware, cyber attacks. And so um, our organization um, recognizes that's a very critical risk. And so we actually do quarterly cyber exercises with our cyber team. Now, um, once a year, we invite um, all the executives to participate because our cyber team is made up, the initial team is made up of IT professionals and things like, and then we also have a layer of management as well. But once a year we invite our entire executive team. <clears throat> so I look at that as a way to showcase the good work that our IT department has done in terms of providing good policies, procedures, uh, processes example and so when we do an exercise I make sure to highlight and to, and because I facilitate and set up the scenarios to showcase some of their good work so the that does a couple things one it gives the executives 
or the people that are not as familiar with some of the the the, all the dirty work that goes on with when you know there's uh, attacks or cyber things they th it helps raise their awareness and education and also gives them confidence that like wow our IT group they do a lot of great things that I wasn't even aware of so anytime I have a chance to showcase something um, that is good that's going on that maybe other people aren't aware of I also do that I think that's brilliant Ron it's, it's not just the domain I think you've taught them about how to do well in life um, for the organization and carry people along with you really uh, thanks very much uh, probably one last question um, what does it take to be a good high caliber BCF professional So this is this is a, a story I've shared at other conferences. So when uh, during before Y two K, so back, way back in two thousand, uh, I was working at a AT and T, uh, mul very large multinational company, and <clears throat> I was working in the customer support area, managing a team, and and I knew that I wanted to do something else. And so after a, um, a long vacation, uh, talking with my wife, um, I decided I need to make a move um, to another area. I want to investigate other areas. And one of my mentors encouraged me to go into IT. And so I looked at the job postings within the organization, which is easy because you're an internal candidate. And I saw a posting, I, I, I think it was called, if I remember, IT business continuity coordinator and it and it was in the IT department and I read the description and I said hmm that sounds interesting and so I walked over I found the hiring manager and I walked into his office uh, kind of you know uh, at the end of the day one day and I introduced myself and I said you know I'm interested in the position you have for this coordinator position. And so he invited me in and we chatted. And after about 15 minutes or 20 minutes, he said, so Ron, let me understand, you're interested in this IT business continuity position in our IT department. Um, you've never worked in IT. You don't have any IT education. Um, you don't, um, you know, the only thing you know about business continuity is what you read prior to coming in and you're you're looking for me to hire you and he said he said he said i what you don't have any of that but what you have is excellent presentation you've demonstrated time management you you show initiative you've demonstrated negotiation skills when, when we were talking about my current role um, you're organized and you do project management work he said I can teach you business continuity. I cannot teach you all those soft skills that you currently possess. And so that's what I share with people. It's not about the understanding of business continuity and the 12 steps that you have to go through. It's dealing with the people, listening to their needs, helping them succeed, partnering with them to make um, this added job of creating a business continuity plan or doing something extra as easy as possible and providing as much valuable as value as possible and giving to to in the to give them as much confidence as possible and you need personal and soft skills to do that not just the technical skills thank you so much Ron thanks so much for taking out time I really enjoyed that I really enjoyed your insights your learnings. I've spoken to you before. I enjoyed it then. I enjoyed it now. I'm sure that people who see this video will get some thoughts, insights, ideas. And each small idea that they get will contribute to making them a better and a more informed professional. Thanks once again. You have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.